Good afternoon and welcome to Infantry Base Academy and to today's webinar, which is all about applying the principles of fair wear and tear. This is a subject that is often com uh, talked about by infantry providers, agents and landlords alike. So I thought it would be a great way to um, break down what the um, fair wear and tear is all about. So as you can see here today, we're going to be talking about uh, definition, how is fair wear and tear defined? Understanding the principles, of, and there are five key areas dispute services use to determine how fair wear and tear is applied. Breaking down the costs, and that's looking at the costs and also about ADR as well, which is alternative dispute resolution. And then finally, looking at the property reports and the role of the property reports and the integrations and what they play when apportioning liability. The webinar should be around about 30 minutes long. Sometimes I do go over a little bit, so I apologize in advance, but hopefully um, I shouldn't keep you too long and it will be available um, as a recording for instant access on this website, um, on the Zoom link that you have. So let's get started. Definition of fair wear and tear. So basically, fair wear and tear is the oh, excuse me, is the deterioration of an item or area, and it's, there's often it's due to its age and its normal use. But most people understand fair wear and tear from what Lord Denning has said, and that was quite a long time ago, but it's still in play today. And it's about the tenant making um, and taking care of the property that they are in so that they are responsible and also that they don't cause any damage, either willfully or ne negligently. So they don't mean to do it or they're so um, negligent that they should have known better, but the damage has still been caused to the property. He also said if the house falls into disrepair through fair wear and tear or lapse of time or for any reason not caused by him, and obviously now that would be her and they and them as well and any other pronoun, the tenant is not liable to repair it. So what we've got to think about in the definition of fair wear and tear is that everything in the rental property will at some point need to be replaced or renewed because everything has a shelf life. Anything that you use in your home, anything you do in your home, walking the carpets, open the doors, open the cupboards, everything will generally wear over time through use. And that's where fair wear and tear comes into it. It's about saying, OK, if you're using an item um, for X amount of time, how long should it last? And if you look after it and look after it well and um, keep it clean, keep it tidy, keep it well maintained, um, then you know there's going to be a natural fair wear and tear. And that should be expected from a rental property. But what is not expected and what is not accepted is the fact that, you know, if, um, when there's deterioration that's avoidable or it's due to the tenant's actions or emissions, so that basically they damage something, they fail to look after it, they fail to keep it up to a decent standard or they've not told maybe the landlord or the agent there's something wrong therefore the item is failing or it's not as maybe um, as good as it used to be could be a washing machine could be a dishwasher um, and that's because not the age of the actual item itself but because of how the tenant has used it or misused it so Definition of fair wear and tear is about the deterioration said, of the item or area due to age and through normal use. What you or I would expect an item to be used in the day-to-day -day, um, running of a family home. And that's exactly what it is when it comes to uh, a tenant in a property. It's their family home. So you would expect them to treat it exactly the same as they would do if they actually owned that property. So in order to understand and put into better context what fair wear and tear is, we need to understand what the principles are. So there are five principles that the deposit schemes consider, and these are the age of the items, how old they are, the quality of them, whether they're really good quality, high end or low quality, so therefore that determines how long they will last. Also the um, tenant makeup in regards to who's living at the home, are we talking professionals? Are we talking family for loads of children with pets? Are we talking um, older people, perhaps people that are living in um, residential care that is rented? So it's very much down to, you know, who these um, tenants are and the potential use that they might have. It also comes down to point four here, the life expectancy of the actual item itself, because each item that's um, rented, um, like carpets, like uh, decor, like appliances, 
all have their own kind of shelf life that's often manufacturer led or an expectation within the industry as to how long that particular item or that decor or that carpet may actually last and also the tenancy length because if a tenant is living in the property for a long amount of time, you know, from six months to six years, then the use of the items, the use of the property will differ. So therefore the fair wear and tear will equally deliver, uh, sorry, differ. And that's exactly why these principles are assigned to any potential liabilities when it comes to deposit dispute, so that we can get a really good and accurate understanding of what it is that's either occurred at the property, looking at any damage, any willfulness or any omissions as um, the definition states, um, and looking then to see, okay, well, you know, is that fair? Um, would that um, uh, wear of that particular item of that of the property of the carpet be consistent with its use, with its age, with its quality, with the life expectancy each one is um, assigned. So this is how the dispute service would actually look at the principles and look to apportion liability. So age of items. So if you're talking about furniture and decor um, or any kind of item, it's how old is it? Um, and obviously the age of the item, the older it is, the more the wear and tear increases because it's age, because same as anything, you know, you use a door often enough, the hinges will either creak or seize up or the carpet will flatten and maybe discolor through use. So age is a definite factor. Um, and this is what is used in when we're assessing the extent of responsibility, because how old an item is at the beginning of the tenancy will then definitely impact on what the potential outcome of any deposit dispute will be at the checkout stage. If a carpet, for instance, is newly laid, then obviously the fair wear and tear over, say, a six month tenancy should be relatively minor, apart from what we would normally expect to flattened pile, people walking in the same kind of areas from door to door, room to room, etc. But if that particular carpet has been already been down, say, for a couple of years, and then a tenant moves in, and then they're going to be there for a few more years yet, then obviously that wear and tear will increase. And that, that's a, just a, an acceptance. And if you only have to look at your, I don't know, if you look around where you're sat now or where you are now and look at the, the flooring, you'll probably be able to see that, you know, there are flattened areas, there are some discoloration, it's maybe not perfect unless, it, unless it's brand new. So there's an expectation that, you know, people will use the carpet, they will walk on it, and there will be an expectation that um, there will be some wear and tear. And by understanding what the age of the items are, you'll be able to assign a cost that is both reasonable and proportionate. And that's what the deposit dispute um, schemes look at. What is reasonable? You know, not it's not like an insurance policy where it's new for old. It's about saying, OK, well, the carpet's been there for a couple of years. I've been there for a couple of years. Therefore, that fair wear and tear is reasonable. And, and if it's not, or if there's any damage or any cleaning issues, now okay, what's proportionate? What is fair, bearing in mind the age of the item to the, its use and to its current condition? And this is why inventory reports, interim inspections and checkouts are always, always um, necessary and very much needed as evidence to be able to showcase that difference. Because you can say an item is four years old, five years old, or one year old, or brand new, but you need that information, that pictorial evidence, that written evidence, as well as all the other types of evidence like receipts, et cetera, to be able to understand that. And then that will then help you calculate a settlement amount, i.e. what it's going to cost to either repair or replace if that is proportionate, if that is reasonable to do so. Um, a tenant wouldn't be expected to replace a carpet if the carpet's already been down, say, for five years. A tenant's been there for three. Well, then the carpet's already been in use for five years, so therefore the tenant would not be expected to then pay for a brand new carpet because they haven't used it for all that amount of time. They've only used it for three years. Um, so it's about understanding that calculation, and we'll look at that um, as we go along. And but also about managing expectations when it comes to age of items, because the fact is that everything will naturally wear, it doesn't matter what you have, whether it's an item of furniture, it's a flooring, it's an appliance, anything that you give the tenant to live in that property, there, there will be an element of fair wear and tear. So you've got to manage expectations, not only of the tenant, but also the landlord, also the agent, that they need to expect these things, that everything will not come back brand spanking new. It will not come back without a, a scratch, a mark, a usage mark, a bit of wear, because 
the whole point of renting out a property is so the tenant can live at it in it as their home and treat it as their home and so therefore there will be an element of fair wear and tear in part and parcel of that so when looking at an age you look at it look at exactly how old it is also how long it's been in um, use and then look at the extent of the responsibilities in order to be able to calculate the said the reasonable and proportionate settlement man amount so that um, the tenant quite rightly isn't paying for uh, a new for old kind of policy and aren't paying for you know, anything that um, has been effectively preceding their own tenancy, any damage, any issues that are already present, which is why, again, an inventory is so important. We're going to look at the quality. Um, so quality obviously determines replacement value. So if you're asking for replacement value, say, again, we'll, we'll use the carpet because everybody uses the carpet as an, understa as an understanding for this. Um, if the carpet is a very high quality, 26 to say 45 pounds per square meter, then you expect then that a replacement would be of similar value, bearing in mind the calculations have got to be made. But equally, if the uh, carpet is maybe five to 10 pounds per square meter, then the quality is likely to be a lot less. So again, you wouldn't expect the tenant to be paying at the higher level for an item that is actually of a lower quality and value. So we need to understand that. Now, from our point of view as inventory providers, as inventory professionals, nine times out of 10, we won't know what this is. We will have an understanding. We'll be able to see, you'll be able to get a bit of a feel from the quality of the carpet, often whether it feels um, thin underfoot. Um, the, the visual quality of it, whether it, it looks dull, faded already, and, and, um, and it's only been in six months, the likelihood is the quality isn't necessarily there. Whereas quality carpets tend to be, uh, or tend to hold a lot of their color, their, their shape, the, 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 the flattening of the pile, the, um, the actual weave itself um, is a lot better if the quality is a lot better. So that's why your descriptive reports and condition comments are so, so vital. You've got to be very, very clear exactly what it is you're seeing, describing it, saying about the condition comments, is it new? Does it have furniture in dents? Is it flattened? Is it color discolored? Is it um, stained or marked or is there burn marks? To understand when then what the replacement value will be. And obviously this is supported by quality photography or video, depending on which medium you use or both. Um, it's entirely up to you and your services to how you do that key thing is it's got to be clear it's got to be obvious and it's got to support what it is you're saying so the written word is then supported by the photography or the video not the other way around um, some providers will try and you know, use the photography side, the pictures, as the basis of the report. But that's no good because then the de the deposit dispute people will look at the picture and go, great, yeah, I get a bit of an understanding, but I need more information. And if you're not providing that, then they'll only go on what they can actually physically see. Um, another way of understanding the quality is the receipts. If you've got a receipt or the landlord's got a receipt, include it in the report where possible, or at least make sure that the landlord has that available to them should um, it go to dispute so that they can then say, well, this um, carpet was bought on this day, six months or two days or three years before the tenant moved in. Your, your report, the inventory report or the checkout report will then show exactly what that um, carpet looked like at the property at the time and then the adjudicator can then make a balance and proportionate um, decision ruling as it were to um, apportion a part of the deposit to the landlord or provide it completely in its entirety back to the tenant bearing in mind the evidence they have in front of them so you need to understand to said what the quality is. You need to have those descriptive reports, condition comments, and you need to have the quality photography or video in order to be able to understand exactly what the item looks like in its context in the property. And I said, and if you can back that up by receipts, that would be absolutely ideal. But we know most of us, you know, in experience is that um, we don't generally get to see the receipts, um, but the main thing is to encourage the landlords, encourage the agents to make sure that they keep them, keep them separate and keep them to one side should they ever need them. Tenants, as we said earlier on, are one of the factors in regards to looking at the principles because everybody will potentially, 
um, use the property slightly differently. So certainly in my experience, students don't tend to uh, worry too much about cleaning. They don't tend to worry too much about damage. They are more kind of like in the moment, enjoying themselves at um, university, getting at, about, um, you know, going to their classes, going with their friends, enjoying their student life. And why wouldn't you? Um, but often then that's where a lot of damage is, is caused or a lot of cleaning issues, of course, because, you know, they don't necessarily have the same kind of not necessarily the values because that would be wrong because not um, every student um, doesn't look after property, but you know, often the, they feel that cleaning is a secondary consideration to coursework or to going out with friends and, and, um, and the like. So how they use the property will differ to say a professional couple. Um, maybe um, they're out the uh, home eight, nine, 10, even, you know, even more hours a day. It's all about work. And then home is literally just somewhere to relax and enjoy it. And they tend to look after the property in a different way. That doesn't necessarily mean that they won't um, live um, in a, a way that maybe constitute um, issues with looking after property, keeping it clean, keeping it damage free, you know, not um, uh, engaging anything that will could either be construed as willful neglect. Um, but I, and again, my experience has been that um, some of what you would necessarily say uh, very professional people like doctors and lawyers, etc haven't always looked after the property as well as a family or even a student so it's very much um depends on the individual but this is a way of kind of understanding the kind of groups that rent properties at the moment um and obviously like with families you know and children and also with pets or you know lump it all, all together is the fact that you know families tend to relax more they tend to be in the property for longer so therefore the fair wear and tear is likely to be higher children are just children you know they're interested in doing what they need to do playing and um, you know enjoying life which again is great um so you know the odd mark here the pen mark there something dropped on the floor doesn't necessarily resonate as much as maybe if it was a professional couple um equally pets pets have accidents it happens you, there's nothing you can do to stop that um, most people are very very kind of particular in regards to pets that'll clear up straight afterwards or make sure the pets are clean themselves the property is clean but ever so often you will come across a property that's not kept in the same way and and that effectively is being neglected by the tenants so therefore the pets are maybe not well controlled maybe not using outside toilet facilities they tend to use carpets and stairs corners especially if it's cats cats like corners um, so the likelihood of damage with pets is higher. That is a natural thing to understand. Um, and, it, you know, sometimes it's not willful neglect. It's just part and parcel pets. Um, they will do what they need to do when they need to do it. And sometimes you, you can't stop them. Um, but, you know, it's all about understanding this and understanding what potentially might happen in the property because of the type of people that are living there, the type of tenants. Um, and also there's a bit of a, a ratio of bedrooms to people renting kind of consideration as well, because if you have a lot of people in a very small space, then the fair wear and tear is likely um, to be more of an issue, because if you've got four or five people maybe using a property that realistically is only big enough, say, for two, maybe three, um, it's going to be um, or it is going to wear out a lot more quicker. Things are going to get used by a lot more people in probably a short amount of time. Therefore, the wear and the tear on that will increase. Um, and therefore, it's more likely you're going to potentially get damage or disputes at the end of the tenancy at the point of checkout. So understanding how many people are in the property, as well as the type of the families and children and pets, and the available space to them will often be able to um, dictate exactly you know what wear and tear will actually potentially look like especially now at the moment there's a huge lack of stock in the industry um, people are having to ne not necessarily rent where they would like or the type of property they like but more so because that's all that's available so you might get families that realistically need a four bed in a two bed maybe just temporary so you know th there is a potential there for fair wear and tear to be looked at slightly differently so you you need to understand exactly who the makeup of the property the type of people that are renting in order to have an understanding and being able to 
I said, apportion any fair wear and tear appropriately. And so that, you know, no tenant and or landlord are in any way kind of like um, uh, left out of the equation. And also um, that they are effectively not considered and that, um, that they end up out of pocket for want of a better phrase. We talked about life expectancy, um, and again, use the carpets as the analogy because it's so much easier, or the reference point. Carpets, they tend to last between three and five years, depending on the quality. The higher the quality, the longer that they will last. Um, I've seen some carpets, especially older style carpets, and I think they're called Axminster. You know, they're really kind of detailed, really colorful kind of ones um, that you're maybe were in your nan's home when you were a child they tend to last longer but just the way they are whereas the kind of newer ones they tend to be um i don't know if it's throwaway culture but they don't tend to last as long but then that said does depend on the quality how much you're paying for it you there is an expectation the more you pay the longer it will last um similarly for laminate and vinyl flooring between five and ten years on average depending again its use the quality um and where that laminate and vinyl flooring is hardwood between 15 and 50 years um, um but i don't necessarily think that um people take into consideration things like stiletto heels or items being dropped on the floor which then can cause indents and damages and a lot of scratches so that it needs to be maintained so again that's again where you've got to look at well how is the property maintained it, are the tents given the right tools to maintain it do they have the right understanding do they have guidance um the right varnish or is the landlord keeping up on the maintenance of the property so these all factor in um decor on average between three and five years you know, walls naturally get touched, um, pictures put up, nails put up, people repaint or just general scuffs and marks. And I'm sure if you're looking around now your room, you probably can see the odd mark here or there. Um, often you don't even know how you've done it, but they just seem to appear. And that's normal. That's everyday life. But what wouldn't necessarily be normal is if you've got great big gouges outside of, you know, out of the walls or you've got great big scrape marks or great big um, blemishes and grubby finger marks or the children have decided that that white wall is a great way to, to learn how to paint. Um, those kind of things, no, you wouldn't expect to, to see and certainly would expect the tenant to rectify. So a decor will generally last very much depending on, again, quality of the paint or the um, wallpaper, but also how many people are in the property and how it's used. You know, is it well maintained? Is it cared for or is it not? Life expectancy of appliances. Um, I did look at putting some numbers down on, on here, but to be honest with you, it very much depends on the type, the use and the quality of the appliances. Um, some appliances, especially today, um, so for argument's sake, uh, some people think that things like Beko washing machines don't last very long, but Samsung ones do. It depends on the maker, the quality, the type, and like you said, its use. So um, the I think it's TDS, and I'll put it on the show notes, have actually issued a very useful kind of guide of exactly what appliances um, are and are likely to last for, which you can use as a guide when it comes to a portion liability and also cost um, and again we go back to what we're saying um, about tenants about ratio of bedrooms to people renting because again if you've got more people renting in a smaller property it's likely to get worn out a lot lot quicker than you would um, normally expect and and that's where we come to quality versus use so the higher the quality um, means it should last longer but then it does very much depend on the use and this is I think brought home to us certainly at the moment in regards to working from home if you think about it a lot more people are actually working from home so of course then your carpets are going to get potentially a lot more grubbier um, there's going to be more marks on the walls, maybe more marks, marks on the banisters. Um, covered doors going to be opened more if you're anything like me, constantly making a cup of tea, getting a cup of coffee, going from one room to another. So you are going to um, increase the what we determine as fair wear and tear a lot more because we're using things more. We're, whereas it used to be, we would be eight out of the um, property, say for eight hours a day. Now we're practically in the property for almost 24 hours, depending on you know, what you're doing from a work point of view. So of course, then it's natural that 
things will get worn quicker. Um, I, I use my own property as a prime example. I've got cream carpets. Um, I think I've cleaned them four or five times since lockdown, whereas beforehand I was only cleaning them maybe once or twice a year because I'm using them more. I'm home more um, and I've noticed they're getting grubbier quicker. So of course then I'm cleaning them more. But if the tenant's not cleaning them as regular as they may be used to or not at all, then of course then they are gonna come up more grubby, they're less likely to last, they're more likely to wear. So therefore the replacement or the life expectancy will obviously change. And this will naturally dovetail into tenancy length. So depending on the tenancy will depend on the natural wear. So if you've got six months and a carpet of high quality, you wouldn't expect much wear. But if you've got a tenancy that's six years for the same carpet, then the wear is going to be likely to be more because, again, we've used it for a lot longer time. Um, and that's why quality is key. Um, some landlords would rather um, go on the lower end of the quality scale because it's cheaper. And I understand that because in some quarters, there's an expectation that, well, it's not going to be looked after so why spend a lot of money because I know I'm going to have to replace it anyway but the other train of thought is well if it was quality in the first place then the likelihood of you having to actually um, replace it is probably less and obviously again bearing in mind all the other factors we've already discussed about people types of tenancy lengths etc that will all come into the equation but if the quality is there and the tenants are referenced right and the tenants are helped and supported in order to maintain the property then the likelihood is that the items will last for that much longer which means less replacement value and of course less deposit disputes which is the key aim here and this is again what we talk about when it comes to about managing expectations if a landlord isn't going to spend a huge amount on the property getting out to a very good or at least a a relatively good um, spec or level, then in some respects, you could argue, well, should they really expect it to be given back in um, the kind of uh, quality or condition that they um, would like? Because the fact is, it's not great quality. It doesn't mean a tenant can just do whatever they want. And it doesn't mean that just because it isn't great quality, well, you can just do um, use the carpet, not clean it and not make a difference because the, the landlord won't care there's still an element of that but I think it's about managing those expectations and this is why it's so so crucial to understand what the condition is at check-in as well as also check out you need that side-by-side -side comparison you need to understand exactly how good or what the quality was or what the life expectancy potentially is when the tenants check in to when they check out to give you that comparison, to give you that understanding so you can say, okay, what I'm seeing in front of me is absolutely commensurate with the um, number of people in the property, the tenancy length and how they've looked after it. Equally, it clearly works the other way that it, you know, if the tenant hasn't looked after it um, and there's your before and after pictures and you can see a property that's been well-maintained and very and clean before, at check-in and the check-out is not, then you've got an immediate material change. And the key thing is you can evidence it. And that is going to be the main thing that you've got to focus on as an inventory professional. So breaking down the costs. This is a generic um, kind of costing that I understand dispute um, schemes use and certainly TDS use because this is where this is from. So as you can see here, um, it's a quick calculation of, and we've done um, something like this within our Learn How to Produce Professional Inventory Reports and a couple of other uh, courses. So we've given you a calculator or a spreadsheet to be able to do this rather quickly. Um, and the idea is, is to work out, okay, what the cost of a sim similar replacement would be. So again, we're looking at a carpet, the actual age of the uh, um, carpet that exists, the actual age of existing, um, and then the actual lifespan. So if it's already in, uh, or been in use for two years, but the lifespan was five, then effectively the residual lifespan is three. So that's, that's how much length is left. And then you do a depreciation of value calculated by A, which is the cost of similar replacement divided by C, which is the useful lifespan. And that gives you an average kind of number for per year of what it might be to um, actually work out the depreciation value. And then you can work out the um, actual apportionment cost. 
So that's the potential apportionment to the tenant um, should there be a dispute. Um, and this will work along not just carpets. <laughs> I know I keep using this as, a, as an example, but it will work along the same lines as appliances, as items, as furniture, anything that, um, that is given the tenant to use um, in the property. So, and it's also decor as well. So you would use this calculation to work out that um, if the decor was of a higher grade and it should have lasted five years and the tenant's only been in two years and so effect, sorry, the tenant um, hasn't has been in force. So uh, there's two years um, of, of it actually existing. So there's three years left and then work out from there. So it, the calculation works exactly the same. But there is an alternative um, dispute resolution option. Um, and often what we say is, is that um, before you even get to dispute, you should be talking to the tenant, should, should, should be talking to the landlord, they should be talking to each other and also the agent in order to understand and um, you know, come to a resolution should there be issues, especially at the end of the tenancy. Um, but if we are gonna go down the um, ADR route, um, deposit schemes, as you can see here from TDS, they won't consider disputes until after tenancy is lawfully ended. So, if there's a client dispute already about the carpet condition, um, say interim, the di deposit dispute service will not look at that until the tenancy is actually finished. So this ends up then a conversation between either yourself as the infantry professional, the landlord and the tenant, or all three, or the agent, or you might come out of the conversation, you just give them a report and then they get on with it, which is generally the case, is generally how it's worked. Um, but until that tenancy is lawfully ended, the dispute service will not get involved. And it's something that needs to be reminded to certainly some landlords, some agents, some tenants when it comes to the, you know, um, I didn't do that. That was like that beforehand at interim, which often happens. And then all of a sudden we end up with a very long protracted conversation that often then leads all the way through to the checkout. And then by that time, tempers are frayed and people's expectations have gone completely out the window. And then that's where we get a lot of problems. So I'm always saying to people, you know, start the conversation early. That's why interim inspections are so, so important, because if you can see a deterioration, if you can see an issue, if you can see something's likely to become an argument or problem at the end of the uh, tenancy, you can start addressing it quickly and early so that it doesn't have to then end up in dispute. It's said time and time again, um, but it's always worth saying that the deposit belongs to the tenant unless and until the landlord can establish a valid claim to the deposit or part of it. Um, it this still seems to be a misconception amongst some landlords um, and even some agents in some respects that the deposit isn't just theirs. It's theirs to do what they want with. And it's never been that way. And, it, and from what I understand, it never will be. It's the tenants and it's for the landlord and the agent and yourselves as professionals to prove that there is some kind of valid claim against it, bearing in mind what the property is like or what the issue is like, what the damage is like and against what the property was originally like at the beginning of the tenancy. Um, and as you can see here, they say the landlord and tenant must make every effort to resolve any dispute by negotiation. So this is another reason why um, it's good to start negotiation early. It's no good waiting until you get to the uh, end of tenancy date and then have a massive conversation at that point. It's never going to go well. It never does go well in my experience. And yet if we'd started it earlier, it wouldn't have been necessarily a bigger problem, or at least then the tenant would have had a chance to rectify the issue, repair any perceived damage, or at least had that conversation. Um, one thing that often isn't mentioned is that every party uh, to the dispute is responsible for their own costs of preparing and submitting their case. Um, the schemes offer the ADR process as part and parcel of the scheme, but in order to gather the information, to do a report, to go and get receipts, get quotes, etc., that is down to each of the parties. It's not for um, the uh, deposit dispute service to get involved with. They just want the evidence. So it's about us as professionals preparing the report, the landlord preparing the uh, receipts and the quotes, and the agent may be preparing um, the conversations or the interim inspections, depending on who has done them. And the key thing in every dispute is the adjudication um, and the decision of the adjudicator is final and it is binding. Um, 
anything over and above the actual dispute that the uh, uh, that say for argument's sake it's five hundred pounds in dispute, but the actual deposit held is only three. That extra two hundred that will then have to potentially go to small claims court. The T TDS, my deposits, uh, DPS, they will only deal with um, the issues result, so um, referring to the deposit for the amount that's held by the deposit scheme. Anything over and above that would then have to be taken out um, and dealt with separately, like I said, small claims court or county court or um, um, higher, depending on what the issue is. So they will only adjudicate on what is available as funds to them within the current schemes. But again, key thing is here, have the conversation early. Do, don't wait until you get to the to end of tenancy day and literally have that conversation there. I've seen it happen before. We've had a landlord and tenant literally nose to nose, having a real big argument about it. And you're stood there as the clerk thinking, well, I need to get on. I need to get this job done. I need to get this report sorted out. And they're already arguing. And I haven't even finalized it. I haven't even submitted my evidence yet. And yet here they are. And that often is because the fact is they've just allowed things to build up and they've not tackled it early enough. So I think it's incumbent upon us as professionals to advise our clients, to advise um, the agents, the landlords and the tenants um, what they should be doing very early on. And that one of those is to talk have the interim inspections and then and look at the interim inspections and then deal with the maintenance. Don't let things build up until it becomes a bigger and more difficult and equally more expensive problem right at the very end. So property reports, which we've already mentioned and we've already mentioned them all um, throughout, um, are key to this whole, whole process. If you don't have an inventory, then you don't have your starting point. You don't have a record to say, okay, this is what it looked like when I first started. Therefore, so I started a tenancy or handed over the keys to the tenant. Um, then the adjudicator will then say, well, okay, well, how can I judge it? How can I look at what you're saying at checkout and then look at inventory if it wasn't compiled or it has been compiled, but I can't see or understand what it is you're saying. There's not enough pictures. The evidence isn't there or the evidence isn't clear enough for me to understand because a deposit dispute adjudicator won't sit there trying to sift all the way through the information, trying to understand what it is that you meant. That's one of the reasons why they don't like acronyms. They don't like loads of glossaries with loads of different ways of saying the same thing um, because it, it's confusing, it's time consuming, and they wanna know exactly what it is that they're looking at the property and they don't wanna be trying to literally trudge, as I often say, fruit treacle, trying to figure it out. Um, our job as professionals is to make it as easy as possible. So make your reports clear, make your, um, your condition comments as detailed as possible, give them the evidence, show them the pictures, the photographs, the videos, um, so that it's very clear. So they get it in that mind's eye, so they can literally look at the report and go, yep, I get that, I can now make a balanced decision. Similarly, check-ins. Check-ins at the moment are mostly done, certainly in my experience, by agents. Um, they're a little bit of a cost cut in exercise in some quarters. Equally, some agents prefer it because then they can test the alarms right there in front of the tenant rather than paying a third party contractor like a, an inventory professional to do that for them. Or they use it as part and parcel of services, a USP for the landlord to say, look, we do we offer a personal service. So therefore, we always carry out the check-in. And then if there's any problems, we can deal with it. And that's fine, as long as they're done. Um, often I find check-ins aren't done. They're very kind of like seen as a, oh, do I have to kind of role. And yet they actually, they're really quite useful because sometimes things do change between inventory and check-in, or there might be some other considerations to deal with when, she, you know, when you're actually checking the tenant. Um, it, you know, it could be things like um, um, you know, breakages or damaged windows or floods or repairs that maybe should have been done and haven't been done. And I've certainly seen uh, a few where we've checked in tenants and promised maintenance hasn't occurred. Tenants have been quite rightly upset. Um, and therefore that's then created a problem as well. So checking is quite important because often, certainly as an infantry provider, we end up as the go between the parties. And sometimes because we are third party, because we don't have a vested interest, we can actually calm the situation. We can, we can take the dispute out of um, the conversation, you know, calm it down, um, de-escalate it and get people talking properly rather than just end up in a great big argument. 
Um, interim inspections are so, so vital, but again, not enough of them are done or they're not done regularly enough. Sometimes they're only done once a year or maybe uh, once every six months if someone remembers to book them. Whereas if you did them every three months, Yes, some people can say, well, you know, why should I have it, my, you know, my property um, invaded, for want of a better phrase, by an inventory professional over three months. But they're often very, very quick, 10, 15, 20 minutes maximum. They give a or provide a wealth of information, the great um, way of getting um, some maintenance issues dealt with even quicker if they're put into an interim report, because then if that maintenance issue isn't dealt with and it becomes a problem for it comes at checkout, then there's a complete um, audit trail of this is when you were informed, um, this is when it was highlighted, the interim, the pictures, the information from the tenant, so that it goes to all towards that evidence trail. Um, and quite often they're seen as really useful, almost like as welfare checks for tenants, especially in the last couple of years, they've been very, very important. We've not always been able to do them in person, but certainly with the infantry-based system, we can certainly do them um, in regards to either the self-service or the ten tenant self-service inspections, which really do help um, with the uh, evidence collection throughout the tenancy. Um, and then of course, then the checkout. If you've got an inventory and then you've got your checkout, you've got the side-by-side -side view, you've got all the evidence that you need in order to be able to provide a fully audited tenancy from a paperwork point of view, from a report point of view. Um, and then that checkout will then highlight any issues and then make sure that then they're apportioned correctly. So who's liable? Is it a maintenance issue? Is it a tenant issue? Is it a landlord issue? And then all of these will then become part of the evidence bundle going towards the uh, adjudicator. So if you've got all four key reports going towards a deposit dispute, then there's more of a likelihood that though that dispute will actually um, be um, successful. And that could be successful from an agent point of view, a landlord point of view, or from a tenant point of view. Um, because our job as infantry professionals is not necessarily to favour one side over the other. It's about reporting the facts. It's about saying what is there, making sure that it's clear that the evidence is available and it's not leaving anybody scratching their head. They get it, they understand it. And then the adjudicator can make, like I said, a reasoned and apportioned um, decision and an award, depending on what it is that they see. We don't have these reports they're going to struggle. We will struggle um, providing the evidence, the landlord will struggle providing it to the adjudicator, and of course then the agent struggles because they're having to manage that whole relationship. Integrations are also key as well, so inventory base integrate with the depository. So what we do there then is that any actions, any deposits, uh, any issues, maintenance issues, damage, et cetera, can all be highlighted within the actions feature. And then when the report is uploaded, then that will then automatically go into the depository in order for them to then look at apportioning both liability and also cost. And within the actions function, depending on the kind of package and scheme you've got with us, with inventory base, you can see there, you're able to set, put in exactly what the actions are. So here you've got needs cleaning, who's responsible for so the tenant, what needs cleaning. So you've got bedroom one, you've got windows and what the price is. And then create an action in regards to whether um, it's gonna be done, who by, and then it, it will then get marked off as done or not. And then it's easier for, to um, apportion the cost against the deposit as well as. Um, tenants will have a right reply. They'll be able to say whether they agree, whether they don't. But the whole point of the integration, certainly with the depository, is to make the whole checkout process, that flow of information as seamless, as frictionless as possible, so that when it comes to deposit disputes, we are not in a protracted conversation, a protracted argument, that the tenant gets back the money that they are quite rightly entitled to, less any deductions that again are apportioned correctly and that um, that is reasonable and also that um, everybody agrees with. There, there's always gonna be potential there for disagreement, but if we've got all the evidence and it's very clear, then realistically, you're taking a lot of the emotion, a lot of the aggravation away from the conversation because you're saying, this is what it looked like at inventory, this is what it looked like at interim, and this is what it looked like at checkout. There's been a clear deterioration, a clear 
issue um, it could be willful it could be neglect it could be more than what is considered fair wear and tear and then apportion it correctly and then you know nine times out of ten that there won't be much room for argument because the evidence is very clear and um, and easy to understand and like I said, and that's where you get to the deduction side. So you can see, you know, what gets deducted. And as you can see here um, with the depository, with the integration, you can see exactly what needs cleaning. The report gets imported, the information, the pictures, the detail, how much it's going to be, whether there's a specific uh, tenancy contract clause within the actual AST to say, you know, what they should have done, what they didn't do. Um, and then this makes, again, the whole process really, really quick. And certainly as a USP from our point of view as inventory professionals, having these kind of integrations like the depository and the other integrations that we have with fixed flow, um, with repeat, et cetera, it just makes um, the journey, the tenancy process so, so much easier. And if you can quicken that process, but keep it accurate and also evidence-based, then um, the experience, the tenancy experience for both the landlord, the agent, and also the tenant themselves is going to be a lot more positive. And again, that's a great USP from our point of view as providers. So that is fair wear and tear and applying the principles. Hopefully you found that useful, informative. Um, you can contact us here, as you can see here on the numbers shown below or the email address at sales at inventorybase.com or visit the website at um, inventorybase.co.uk, but you might want to put a, a dot at the www dot inventorybase.co.uk um, and then you can find out how inventory base and, and also us as inventory base academy can support and manage your training and also your software needs and if you do have any other questions um, i will um, put all this information and show notes and also contact details including the tds link um, onto the show notes ready for you um, to view whenever you would like to. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for joining uh, me, Sean, at Inventory Base Academy with Inventory Base. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar. Thank you.